So invited speakers generally told us we were good organizers up to this moment in which uh, <laughs> we prepared the panel session. Uh, I mean, I'm a bit fond of this format in which uh, I hope you will have uh, all the opportunities to exchange uh, questions mostly related about where the field is moving. And uh, yes, it's still an occasion to, to debate uh, and discuss publicly about ideas and thoughts you might have had during these three days. I'll be the, the moderator and uh, you will find Alessandro Laio, Christoph Schutt, Francesca Grisoni, Sasso Jerowski, Andrea Nelli and Giulia Westermeyer in the panel. And they've been gathered because of the, an expertise uh, which is mostly related, not only of course, but mostly related to working on the design of molecular systems. So I'll break the ice with one question and then I hope that uh, the stage and Zoom will contribute with even further questions. And uh, my question is, if you had to identify one problem that needs to be solved to push uh, our community further and be even more helpful in uh, defining uh, better drugs or better molecular systems with greater functionality. Uh, what is this problem and uh, how do you think this might be solved in a few years? <laughs> As I mentioned, that's the moment in which... <laughs> Go ahead, the bravest, the first. Okay, uh, since I am the least material science, I'm the, the greatest outsider here. Um, to me, it appears that uh, quite an important problem is to distinguish clearly between molecules and materials. Because my intuition is that there is more to materials than, than just the molecules. There is also the, the structure, the, the crystal structure, but I, I'm a computer scientist, so I don't understand fully the complexities of this. I just know that there is this difference, and I think this difference should receive more attention and, uh, you know, systematic ways to describe uh, the, the structure or whatever other aspects there are to materials in addition to the molecules. So this, this for me, is, is quite a priority. And, uh, I mean, on the computer science side, I don't think it will be that much of a problem to represent it, but it's very important to understand it. And uh, I have the feeling that this understanding is not really wide, widespread. Uh, well, um, so I don't know if I am able to identify a, a, a real big open problem which has not yet uh, uh, received uh, a lot of attention. So there are many, many important uh, things that have to be done in order to really achieve, a, 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 let's say, a fully uh, reliable tool, like, for example, treating electrostatics or uh, like dealing with uh, uh, polyatomic systems with uh, very, very heterogeneous features. In, well, all of these directions, I think that there are uh, ongoing uh, advanced uh, attempts. So I wouldn't say that uh, any of this problem is uh, in any manner, uh, uh, literally speaking, unsolved. So there are steps forward that have already been done. Uh, other steps forward are for sure necessary. So if I can make a gen generic comment on uh, uh, how the community is exploiting uh, ma machine learning and artificial intelligence tool to solve uh, uh, like, um, yeah, uh, for example, design, molecular design problems. My personal impression is that the level of, uh, um, of uh, um, complexity of the machine learning tools, which are used, uh, they say in our community, still lags behind what uh, is out on the market now in other fields, like for example, image processing or uh, natural language processing. Uh, so the thing is that uh, in, in these other fields, uh, well, the idea of using a two layer uh, perceptron fully connected is something that, uh, yeah, people would look 
at you like if you were crazy somehow, no? Uh, because now there are much more uh, advanced uh, tools. Uh, like for example, it is, it is becoming clear how the role of depth of deep neural network uh, for, for learning complicated uh, features is absolutely essential. It is also becoming clear why uh, width of the representation is, uh, is important. Uh, so all of these things on one side, it is becoming theoretically clear why you should do it. And on the other side, people are using these, uh, these things uh, more and more uh, uh, successfully. Hmm? So here I actually see a lot of room for improvement by uh, let's say hiring from uh, uh, from uh, other communities uh, the tools that are continuously coming out uh, that, and that are in fact uh, yeah more and more advanced and yeah basically to translate this tool for applications in uh, uh, for example in material design or molecular design Um, so I think what we've seen at this workshop is that um, the, a lot of the previous research, so in what I'm doing uh, most of the time, which is uh, neural network potentials, was consider uh, what was dealing with how to really describe um, local environments. And I consider this problem, yeah, not perhaps not completely solved but really almost solved with what we've seen here i mean all the solutions start to converge as we've seen with these uh, generalized ace uh, techniques for example because and, and if you look at at the equivariant neural networks like nequip or pain you see some advancements in the technical side with allegro where it's about scalability for large systems and so on but basically uh, all the solutions converge to in this to to uh, yeah to tensor products in the end, and I think that this is now going towards basically like you would say in an in a, in an image context we would say I'm using a convolutional network. Now in an atomistic context, you would say I'm using an equivariant network, and then you use these layers that have some details around them uh, that that. That makes some difference, but not it's it's nothing completely crazy. Um, so what I think is the next logical step is to look at more of the the, the semi-local and the long-range part, and also um, something that only few uh, research uh, publications have dealt with um, previously in this field is. Um, different charged systems, um, spin states, and um, um, excited states. So I think this is really an important topic um, yeah, in the for the next years. Okay, I can uh, give a perspective more from the drug discovery domain, and I agree with some of the things that were said. Like for sure, we need. Um, better representations for certain types of problems, like what happens when you try and improve formulations. Um, it's really difficult to represent formulations in you know, such a way that we could play around with it and learn in an end-to-end -end fashion from those. Um, but I think that what we really struggle with here is mostly to innovate. Like whenever you want to, for example, in the de novo design domain, uh, whenever you want to produce something new, something slightly or quite different from your training set, you struggle. So I think active learning is really promising to help us generate our own data. And I dream of like uh, fully integrated platforms where you can quickly iterate over your data, you, you launch your calculations there, the molecules get synthesized and tested and you get it back so that we can generate the data we need and slowly moving out um, from our training set uh, molecules. Um, but also I think uh, along these notes, um, we could also try and improve the out of domain generalizability of our models, because otherwise we are stuck with what we have and with the diversity we have in our training set. So this is where I think we should uh, try and, and move. And definitely, of course, it's always important to uh, connect with the domain experts. So I think um, explainable AI will uh, 
play a big role for us to, to get accepted uh, by the experimentalists and to, to connect and learn from them and have them learn from our, our models. Yeah, and I think that's it. So yeah, I also want to add here. Um, I actually agree with all of these points because they are very good. For instance, we need to distinguish molecules and materials, and then we need to find ways to describe both of them. Like how can we enable heterogeneous catalysis? And as Christoph mentioned, it's also extremely important to somehow investigate different states, different spin states. How can we make use of light? Because there are a lot of materials who can harness light. And we could use this energy to tackle most of the most pressing issues in our world currently. So I think this is one of the most important topics to tackle. Um, well, last point, I'm gonna follow up a little bit on what Sasson and Alessandro just mentioned, but all, all the other points I think are perfect starting point for the discussion, but my, I resonated particularly with the two aspects that were brought up because uh, from Alessandro's perspective, we're a bit lagging behind the development that has happened in other domains of field and, uh, and we can catch up, that's for sure something. But what, what I also observed from my point of view was the fact that we could not leverage the same synergies that the other fields could. They had a shared starting point, perhaps images or representation that there were no doubts worked for their exercises. For us instead, I felt, and this is something I think that expands a bit on what Sasa said before, so the, it was not an obvious solution or an answer. Uh, what kind of representation? What do we even mean by material or molecules? And that's something that we're slowly getting towards to by fragmenting it, right? We've done a divide and conquer approach to uh, how we're gonna tackle the issue and we started deciding that there's gonna be a local information, there's gonna be a long range information and we start from the local things. And it looks like we're doing well, but we're progressing at a slower pace also because there, we're still following this difficulty in distinguishing what is, what defines the solid and what is what defines the molecule. So for sure, by continuing this trend, it will make sense to go long range to complete this ladder to complexity. Uh, but I feel the answer could also lie simply in rethinking deeply on a more generalized way to look at something that is made out of atoms in a hierarchical fashion, which is something the community with more biological systems is used to work with, because in the end you have structures and substructures and from a materials and a molecular perspective, we are still fragmented a bit on the condensed matter. You look at local densities and then a carpet that contains everything else. And from a molecular perspective, there are attempts to do hierarchical stuff, but I now I speak out of my frustration. I, I, I sit in a condensed uh, molecular community and I don't benefit from either because I, we are long range. We are, a, let's say, supramolecular for some aspects, but we are also short range and there is nothing that is tailored for this. And uh, I am not sure whether long range will bring us there in the shorter term. It feels like we need to have in the mindset a hierarchical fashion from the very beginning and uh, reconsider the whole way in which we define an atomic or a molecular entity. So that's my <laughs> little you. point. Thank you very much for all of this reflection. I mean, I totally agree if I can say a bit mine, but I'm the moderator, so I can. Uh, yeah, integrating, uh, the way in which uh, the final molecular material is done is going to be key. And I think it, it touches all the points you, you made about the complexity formulation. Also the question by Nuri about uh, the way in which the molecular crystals have been made. So the, we're going to predict not just the property, but the process to go to the properties. And in this regard, tomorrow panel session will be also uh, related I mean, to energy materials, and uh, we will see also their opinion on that. But at this point, I would open uh, the floor for any questions, either targeted or uh, to the broad audience and whoever wants answers. So please feel free to break the ice also from the audience. Kevin, may I have a first comment? Um, um, so I, I was very glad that this issue was brought up about the, the latest machine learning and other advances not easily making it into uh, use this into material science because it is very, very strongly related to the point I brought up of uh, having a clear understanding of what materials are and how to describe them. Once this point is kind of sorted out, you, you let people from machine learning 
in the other areas stream in because they will understand computationally what the problem is. This is what they are brought up to understand and then they can attack it. If they don't understand that, you are limited to the kind of materials people that have learned a bit of machine learning. And this I think is a, a point to understand and is crucial for the development of the community. Yeah, um, I think, uh, yeah, uh, I, I fully agree that the problem is also formulating what we really want. And uh, in particular now, now, after having thought about it a little bit after your, <laughs> the things that you said, I think that a, a challenge is a, a fully meaningful semantic description of uh, a really complex uh, organic molecule. So, because if you think about it, if you have, um, so if you have a, a, a complex organic molecule, imagine something with, with uh, yeah, many aromatic rings, many links, many everything. So this thing, of course, now we have features that are able to describe the local environment, but so the global connectivity I know that there are uh, tools which allow to encode, like do positional encoding, which is also aware of, uh, uh, yeah, the topology. But so it's simply complicated because you, you, you can have branches, you can have loops, you can have everything, and all of this must be meaningful, must be encoded in a representation. And uh, maybe in uh, machine learning, like all these attention mechanisms which have now been developed could be a manner to go through it. Maybe there are already attempts in these directions. I don't know. But this thing, at least uh, among the things that I personally know, I would say that this is a, at least a partially, well, it's a difficult and at least for what I know, unsolved problem. I don't know if you agree. So I'll come with the microphone. Uh, while we are at this discussion, I mean, uh, Patrick and I, we were talking about this whole aspect of collaborations, uh, and that's exactly what you guys were at. So collaborations are hard, like computer scientists speak different language, or like machine le learners speak different language, physicists speak a different language. And then whenever you would like to collaborate, and then get fruitful interactions out of uh, both of these communities, you will usually you would need some sort of a way to sort of translate one problem into the other and vice versa and see what tools one could use uh, to solve the problem, right? So in your experience, um, working in your respective domains, what has been the best way to um, translate your problem? So let's say you have a physics problem and then you'd like, like to use a machine learning model uh, on it. What has been the best way for you to um, translate the problem in a, in a machine for a machine learner, because then usually they are thinking in terms of either text or images, and then usually there's a lot, a completely different structure. And then it's really hard for somebody who's not thinking in terms of the same things to translate their problem. So I think the question is more of like, how has your experience been with collaborations and what are the best practices that you guys have seen in your work? My, my experiences have been essentially very positive, but you should be aware that you need to take the time and energy to build the bridges. You know, you really have to have the computer science people and the materials people sit and work together on meaningful problems and, you know, over a number of iterations, arrive at a common language. It's just, you, you can't do this in, in a week or in two weeks, but Honestly, I view this whole uh, event and the series of events as an effort in that direction to build this bridge between the machine learning and the materials people. And this is this should be really the tip of the iceberg, you know, what you see at this event. But uh, further down, you know, in the levels that you don't see that are below the water, you should have lots of joint uh, ventures between machine learning and materials people brainstorming. On, on how to solve these crucial issues. 
uh, you know, the materials people should be describing this to the computational people, what they think material is, you know, crystal structures, molecules, all of these, uh, these aspects, and then the computational people should be really working on formalizing these representations in a way that other computer science people would understand them, and in that way, opening the problems to the broader uh, computational uh, sciences uh, forum. I'll, I'll, I'll make a short one about yeah, language which, and grammars, which I think creates a recurring theme both in collaborations as well as in defining a material or defining the good grammar, like what I asked Francesca during her talk or the attempt by Johannes and Zachary on a grammar for catalysts. Uh, so it's becoming uh, really a fundamental scientific and not only philosophical question. Uh, related to languages and I'm really fascinated by it. I, a very quick response to that, Kevin. Uh, uh, we should be aware, you know, today data-driven approaches are extremely popular to the extent that earlier knowledge-driven approaches to solving problems are getting forgotten. You know, before learning grammars in a statistical way, people were actually trying to construct grammars by hand. And while obviously the, the data-driven construction has its advantages, I think the real winning is the combination of the two, that you on one hand have, let's say, sketches of what the grammar would look like. And now I'm talking really of grammars in different areas, both for natural language and for molecules and whatever other problems might show up bringing together both the data and existing knowledge, this is really the winning formula, even though it might not be the easiest one. You know, I, so I, I'm a machine learning person by, by education, but broad enough to consider, let's say, more powerful formalisms for, for representing data and knowledge that come from, from logic. And, you know, people are lazy. They would, you know, if you tell them that besides the data, they need to provide knowledge, they will snub you off. They say, what? You want me to provide knowledge in addition to the data? But really, you know, it's, it's a way to do things better. And, you know, every, every investment you make there can pay off. And the good thing is today you have no longer just databases of data, but you have also, uh, in a way, uh, of, of knowledge. You have uh, you have ontologies. You have uh, uh, you have databases of models in certain areas. Like in systems biology, there is biomodels.net. It's not only the data that is published; it's also models that are, that are published. And once you get to that stage, you know that you have repositories not just of data but also of knowledge. Then you really can work on this connection between data and knowledge and get to new new levels. But Fantastic. it does take it does take effort. You know, it's easier to just use data. It's just that easiest is not always the best. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. Uh, I I was thinking that because there is just a great abundance of different machine learning methods. There's like a dozen of well-established uh, neural networks, Gaussian processes, kernel method, decision trees, et cetera, et cetera. And we all have our favorites. So would it be like, what do you think? Is it better that one person more like a, tries to be an expert on uh, just the one type of methods or focusing on one types of methods? Or would it be better to be like, um, expert a little bit everything like I try to be like this kind of a check of all trades or would it be just better to focus on one type of methods so um i started actually with kernel methods and um, at some point i switched to neural networks but i think it still helps me that i know Kernel, uh, kernel methods and were taught the basics there. And something that everybody should understand uh, is a linear model. Um, you should really, there are some things that might be unexpected, especially in high dimensions. And this is something that I think everybody should look at. 
And then there are other things like tr uh, decision trees, for example, I never looked at, but I think that is perhaps also um, a good thing uh, to also then look in these areas because there's always some potential to combine methods and create something new. So it's always good to have a broad overview view. And then, so basically specialize not too early. Start specializing once you have a bit, ha have had a look around and then specialize, but don't, don't disregard everything else. I would like to comment briefly. So in the, in the machine learning community, there is nowadays lots of effort on something which is called auto ML, you know, finding uh, so that you have automated systems that try different machine learning approaches for you and then give you back the best performing machine learning method. But the prerequisite to use that is a very good understanding and formulation of the problem. I mean, I'm, I'm new to machine learning in materials, but I have been trying to, to use just methods from my machine learning portfolio on problems. And then I find that the current solutions that are used in material sciences are very, you know, matching kernel methods to uh, uh, predicting the energies of uh, configurations of atoms at the, at the kernel level without really formulating the problem as a predictive modeling problem one step back. So you, you, just, you just go directly, you know, into the intestines of the problem very, very deep and you don't even have the very general formulation problem that would allow you to try different machine learning methods on it. So I've been looking at the publications and okay, at that point I, I know how to use kernel methods on that, but I don't know how to use other machine learning methods on that because the problem is not formulated in a general enough way. So I think formulating the problem as, you know, there are categories of machine learning problems, predictive modeling, uh, clustering, approximating probability distributions, these things. So once you, you specify things precisely enough, then you could go for solutions like even auto ML, if you, if you really are just interested in the performance, not, not necessarily in the, in the understanding. If you want to understand the models that are coming back from machine learning, then you need to worry a little bit about using explainable machine learning methods rather than just any black box. But uh, this depends on what your requirements are for solving the problem. One question, one new question. Yeah, so um, in machine learning, or from a well-known uh, researcher, Richard Sutton, there's something called the bitter lesson, which is um, basically that the experience in the last decades of machine learning has been that in the end methods that leverage computation and data the best or even leverage the most computation um, have been the most successful in the end. So we have seen this in natural language processing, image recognition, and so on. And so the question is, do you think this um, bitter lesson also applies to machine learning and material science, that in the end, the incremental advances through human intuition and more domain knowledge will be overtaken by just leveraging more computation. So um, will we also have to learn this better lesson? Do you, what do you think? It's a philosophical point to some extent, but uh, I would say my religion is that I, I believe that knowledge counts and that even if you can arrive at predictive accuracies, which are which are high by just using brute force more computation, I still think there is an advantage to, to generating models which are understandable and can be used by, by people in addition to just uh, computers. I would also like to add here, as Andrea said very nicely in his talk, data annotation is extremely difficult. So there are a lot of challenges that are not solved yet and where we don't know how to actually get the data. So it's not only about um, leveraging computational power, but also about how can we actually get the data that we want to learn. Well, I think a problem uh, related, uh, well, specific to material science, uh, material modeling is really transferability. This was already mentioned. Uh, before in the sense that uh, we don't really want to simply to extrapolate our 
interpolate our prediction, but we want to extrapolate our prediction. This is a problem that doesn't really appear in natural language processing. And this makes a difference, in my opinion. I think on, okay, no. one last question from Zoom. Sorry, uh, would you like to comment? Before? No, no, I was screen for closing okay. remarks, so please. I see. Um, so there is a question in Zoom. Where do you see the potential of analog computing for machine learning methods? It's a bit of a left field question. Analog computing is a tool for making things faster when they are very, very specific. So here the question could be actually reversed. Is there a specific machine learning application where the speed in the response is crucial and in this moment is low? Then in this case, one can imagine to well, to go in the direction of, uh, to go in the, in the direction of uh, uh, analog computing, which is uh, uh, very, very problem specific, typically very difficult. It requires uh, uh, a lot of uh, specific knowledge. It's not like software somehow, no? So here I wouldn't be able to tell a, a, an application in machine learning where this will be the case, personally. Okay, thank you. In the interest of time, I need to close this panel session, but uh, I hope you also enjoyed listening about uh, grammars, extrapolations, and uh, new problems we, I mean, old problems that we need to face. Thank you very much to everybody. <laughs>